13 Ghosts was just another victim to the modest supernatural craze that overtook a rough decade of horror remix and cheaply produced direct-to-video ripoffs that typically cashed in on the slasher genre. Granted, this was a troubling trend that continued into the new millennium, but while Japan produced classics like Dark Water and The Grudge in the same year, Western filmmakers were still trying to get inventive with their ghost stories, such as The Other, Session 9, Dead End, that movie about an evil tooth fairy, I didn't say they were all good, and 13 Ghosts was just one of several remakes of 1950s, 60s supernatural horror movies that nobody asked for. The original 1960 film, written by Rob White, whose screenplay for House on Haunted Hill was adapted into a remake two years prior to 13 Ghosts, was only known for its gimmick and nothing else. It was directed and produced by William Castle, who always sought to make his movies an interactive experience, which, if the interest is there, I'll cover it in a separate video. In the case of 13 Ghosts, since it was a story about spirits who could only be seen by wearing a special pair of glasses, during screenings for the film, audiences were given red and blue cellophane 3D glasses so that they could see the ghosts projected onto the screen if they felt brave enough. Today, the film is like watching a corny episode of Scooby-Doo, which, come to think of it, also had an 80s incarnation called The 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, and Matthew Lillard would eventually appear in both the remake of 13 Ghosts and became synonymous with Shaggy the year after, so there's a crazy internet conspiracy in there somewhere. But before we talk about the positives, let's address the negatives. Look, we could sit and fire back and forth about how nonsensical the plot is, but this film takes it a step further to being borderline unwatchable at times, because I have never seen editing fueled by this much cocaine. And I edit my own videos. Talk about an overbloated mess of choppy, incoherent sequences which somehow, in the process of being as flashy and hyper-stylized as possible, manage to be so incredibly lifeless at the same time. It's the kind of editing that thinks quick cutting is a perfect substitute for genuine jump scares that aren't earned due to a lack of any actual tension. What makes this movie in any way scary are the grotesque creature designs, and I understand the film is trying to show us how intense and unforgiving these ghosts are, but fuck me lad, calm yourself, at least show us what's going on before we have a chance to be scared. There are films that hide their villains as much as possible for ominous and mysterious effect, but this is not that kind of movie. As the title suggests, it's a showcase of horrific ghost encounters, and the encounters we get are absent of subtlety or build up to make them as engaging as they should be. Although I suppose there's some dramatic escalation in how each ghost is released over time, but any resemblance of surprise is lost when you literally catwalk your lawyer through a gallery of ghosts, leaving nothing to your imagination. God! I hate it when they do that! What? They wait for you to stick your face right up against the glass, and then they give you a big fat boom! Don't do that! At best, it's absurd, and at worst, it's honestly just kind of boring. When your ghosts possess more personality than your actual characters, there's clearly something wrong here. I suppose you could pull the whole, well, the ghosts are the stars of the show, which, no shit, Sherlock, but that doesn't help sitting through vapid character interactions any more bearable. I used to hunt ghosts with your uncle Cyrus. Goats? GHOST! GHOST! God damn it! Listen to me! Okay, so like, broadly speaking, for a premise about a family who inherit a house from their estranged ghost-hunting uncle, only to discover the house is actually a prison for these ghosts, and it's revealed one of the ghosts is the main character's recently deceased wife, and the entire thing was a trap set by said uncle to capture another spirit through sacrifice, the lack of meaningful character development makes any scene not involving ghosts or Shaggy a bit of a chore to sit through. I mean, how can you fuck up a premise like that? Now, some of you will say, ah, but listen, dickhead, what if this was a salvage job by the editors to save a troubled production? Well, have you seen Steve Beck's other film? 
In October the following year, Back released Ghost Ship, which I assume given the genre narrative and stylistic similarities could arguably exist in the same universe, because sure, why not? The story was about a salvage crew lured to a cruise liner haunted by evil spirits, with the twist being that they're not evil and instead are trying to warn the crew that it's a trap set by an evil ghost to steal their souls. Granted, the way I described it sounds stupid, but Ghost Ship also had the perfect conditions for a compelling horror movie, yet was also devoid of emotion, or at least had this inept understanding of emotion, resulting in the right setting, plus the creepy concept, equating to unengaging and rather obnoxious execution. Or, to put it more bluntly, Beck is the problem here. He's undoubtedly surrounded by a talented production team, but he clearly doesn't have the vision to make a decent horror movie. And it's no surprise he never made another feature film after these two, so... Can we get someone good to remake them? Like, can we get James Wan after he's done with that Fishman movie? That would be great. Right, now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about how great it is. Okay, so great is a bit hyperbolic, but here's why I love talking about this movie. The environmental and creature designs are horror movie perfection. That's a strong opinion I know, but getting the makeup effects guy and concept design guy responsible for some of the most notable properties in media always yields wonderful results. Simply put, the ugly execution completely squanders what I sincerely believe are phenomenal opportunities to tell a modernized interpretation of the generic haunted house story. The concept behind the house is that it's actually a machine that imprisons the ghosts using containment spells, and as cliched as it is to say, it fundamentally becomes a character itself. In fact, there are actually more main character fatalities as a result of the constantly shifting walls as opposed to the spirits. At one point, I thought the movie was being clever by using the irony that the house was more dangerous than the ghosts because after the lawyer's death, I was more concerned about someone losing a limb. Something I do think is intentional, however, is the persistent sense of disorientation caused by the moving labyrinth. Yes, it feels like the characters are wandering down the same three corridors due to budget constraints, but the repetition becomes gradually claustrophobic and we are given no idea how close the characters are in relation to the ghosts or the ex. It. The film clearly likes to linger on the house given the major technical accomplishment of it, but the ghosts, despite their passionate level of detail, deserve far better treatment considering how the editing limits their screen time in a negative way. What the hell was that? The thing is, they're like creepy pastas before creepy pastas, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that they should be getting far greater appreciation than half the shit that the internet says is scary. While other movies give you just one creature, this movie gives you a dozen of them, and while I'm obviously not going to go through each of them, if you own the DVD or just search for it on YouTube, you'll notice that there's a special feature that dives into a brief backstory for each ghost, and it just adds an even more frightening and tragic element to them. Yeah, some of them are technically harmless, and some are only given the vague illusion of threat, but if we're picking favourites, the Juggernaut will always continue to unnerve me. He's the first ghost we see in the film, and he's the last to be released, but there's a bizarre believability to him. After all, he was literally just an abnormally tall, strong junkyard serial killer who took 50 rounds of ammo to take down, apparently. Out of all of them, he's not the most narratively interesting, but you know that scene from Mindhunter when Holden meets Ed Kemper? It's that feeling of discomfort that crawls under my skin in a profound way that really stays with me, especially when it kicks the shit out of Matthew Lillard later on. None of these backstories are brought up in the film, of course, but like I said in my Dawn of the Dead video, they're narratively stronger than what the movie presents, so it's just weird to me that this material isn't worked into the film in some capacity. There is a certain level of visual interpretation, but if we're talking about the lore that this film establishes, it's surprisingly detailed yet completely falls into the background. So you have this ancient book called The Arcanum, written by the astronomer Basilius while demonically possessed, designed to capture and summon ghosts, and details how to take control of the Ocularis Infernum, which is an eye in hell that lets the user see the past, future, and those who are blessed or damned. And then there's the Necronomicon Ex Mortis, which, the wrong movie, it even has its own language and symbolism, so out of all the nonsense running about throwing passive-aggressive shit at each other, this is the shit you choose to ignore? Ignore? 
I have never, in all my years watching horror movies, seen a greater missed opportunity. All this information is either fragmented impartially throughout the movie, or only found in the special features. But, dare I say it, there is one element that makes this film just a little bit more special. And if you haven't worked it out by now, it's Matthew fucking Lillard. For the record, Lillard is my favourite actor, and I was fortunate enough to meet him at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival a few years back, and naturally he couldn't understand my accent. In this film, Lillard doesn't just chew the scenery, he absolutely devours it, and every time he's on screen, he grabs your attention with just how theatrical he is. Finally a believer! Thank you, O oh Lord Jesus! What is he doing? I don't know. I can't see. I don't have the glasses. In my opinion, Lillard is my favourite part of Scream, and it's largely due to how committed he is to the fun of it. He can definitely pull off a subdued performance when appropriate, but when you've got a concept like this, he brings all the energy, excitement and general campiness you need. And that's not to discredit how much additional caricature the lawyer and nanny bring to balance out Lillard's, uh, distinctive performance, shall we say. If you haven't noticed, I'm a little bit of a freak! I touch somebody, and a whole life full of shit just flashes in front of my eyes. I genuinely believe the film wants him to be the main protagonist, because there seems to be a conflict over how much he pushes Tony Shalhoub's character out of the way, who, side note, is supposed to be the emotional centerpiece of the film given his wife dies in a tragic house fire, and he's haunted by the events as if to insinuate guilt, but he's just a super dull character. And that's a shame for Shalou, given the following year he'd go on to win a Golden Globe, SAG and Emmy for his performance in Monk, but along with F. Murray Abraham, you can tell he's phoning it in for a paycheck. Anyway, back to Lillard. Can I rely on you not to get me killed? I guarantee nothing. So this character, Dennis, is uh, intellectually inconsistent. Sure, the words intellect and consistency don't really have a place in this movie, but I digress. The film plays him off as sympathetic, yet he shows himself to be a monstrous prick most of the time. In fact, there's zero logic as to why he's in the house or why he chose to wear a blazer under a jumpsuit, but the extremity of both questions shows you that you shouldn't read too much into it. Early in the film, he's established to be a deeply troubled and tormented psychic who clearly hates the power he's been given, as it's psychologically broken him. And I will say, it actually begins to justify the editing. He's prone to seizures and migraines, so the jarring provocative cuts make sense contextually to his character. But to say the film is from his perspective is totally false, which is a shame because I felt his suffering. I think that's why there's an odd sense of relief in his death, because as a spirit, he seems relaxed, composed, and at peace. Uh, that said, I hate that it blatantly gives away the fact that he's going to die, but because it's such an intoxicating performance, it's the most indirect sense of dread I've ever experienced in a film, so fair play to its mistakes. So, in conclusion, just go watch the backstory video. I love the whole idea behind this supernatural world, and I think it goes without saying that there's definitely something intriguing buried underneath an unremarkable series of chase sequences. I made this video purely with the intent of highlighting this lost beauty that's otherwise overshadowed by plot holes, shallow characters and dialogue, and filmmaking that feels like scraping a knife and fork against a fucking plate. I respect that there is some level of conviction to a serious premise here, and it just pains me to think of what it could have been under the reign of a different director. This is it for me. I'm on the first fucking plane back to door. Uh -uh. I'm sorry, family, Kathy, Bobby, Uncle, Ghost. I am sick of this nanny shit. I've had it. This was not in the job description. I quit! Hey everyone, as always, thank you so much for watching. Uh, let me know your favorite horror guilty pleasure in the comments below because it hey, it might it might make me do a video on that as well, who knows. Uh, my patrons have voted for the next few videos, so if you want to vote for other content, uh, you even want to get early access and even get the occasional bonus video, uh, please do consider supporting me over on uh, Patreon. Uh, and if you like me talking a lot of shenanigans and talking nonsense, uh, follow me on Twitter. And yeah, uh, until next time, stay safe. I know I forgot to say it last week. Uh, yeah, see you all very soon. Bye.